I want to real quick say this. I don't ever say this. I've been a pastor for 25 years, and I don't know that I've ever mentioned this because, A, from my seat, it's really, really awkward to mention, okay? But October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and um, I want to be very clear on this so that you, I, you, I'm praying that you hear my heart. When Jennifer and I started ministry, we've pastored a small country church in Izzard County, just outside of Melbourne. We were between Melbourne and Mount Pleasant at a little area called the Gyne Y. It wasn't Gyne, because Gyne is further down towards the river, but this was the Y that you took to get to Gyne if you were going there. I didn't know my address. I only knew it is that we lived in the old Sid Black house. Y'all ever know something so country where it doesn't have numbers, it just has what it used to be? That's where we were at. And our first pastor, it was that. It was me. I was a pastor, and there wasn't any other team. It was just me and Jennifer, and I had some great people in the church that served alongside me and, and encouraged me. And I was there for about three years, and God, I said, God, I, I want to go learn. I want to go learn. And so he sent me to a church where I, was now, I wasn't the lead pastor. I was the associate pastor. And I took that job as the associate pastor, which meant what I thought was it meant that I would preach when the preacher didn't preach, and that I would get to learn from the pastor. What it turned out to be was I was the associate pastor, and since I could sing, they made me the worship pastor, and I was the student pastor, and I was the children's pastor. And so luckily, God gave me a wife, and she became the children's pastor, for a whole lot less. We didn't pay her anything. She just knew I was going to die, and she jumped in and began serving alongside me. And when I left that church, everything was good. We left under good circumstance. I just went back into the pastorate. But when we left that church, I said, Lord, God, if you ever give me an opportunity to lead a church, I will build a team. Because I'm exhausted, and I don't think this is how you intended ministry to happen. And so God called us now, oh eight, 16 years ago to plant Real Life Church. And from the very beginning, we built the team. And like I said, it's really awkward for me to talk about pastor appreciation since I'm the pastor, but I want you to hear, I cannot do this. <laughs> I, I, I'm a pretty talented guy. God has blessed me with gifts, and just like he's blessed you with gifts. But I cannot do this without the people that he surrounded me with. My wife, Kirby, Aaron, Stephanie, Tyler, Tim, Judy, Kim, those people that walk alongside me, and that's not even counting the multitudes of volunteers that walk alongside me, um, I celebrate every Sunday knowing that I get to do this with a group of people that make it my favorite thing to do. I, I, I love getting to do what I get to do. So I want to just tell you guys, I appreciate that I get the opportunity to be the pastor of this church and that I get to serve alongside the people that when I am down, There are days I don't know if I want to do this, just like you have in your job. And were it not for the people that come alongside and wrap around me and go, you got it, you're going to be okay. God wins. I'm so thankful and forever grateful. There's a quote by Newton that says, if I have seen any further, it is because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And you all have allowed me to pastor this church, and I will tell you now, and anytime you ask, the reason that this church has any success whatsoever is because I stand on the shoulders of giants that allow me to lead and allow me to feed. And so if you would, for me, this is just me asking you as your pastor, if you want to show appreciation to me, this is how you do it. 
you find that team and you high five them, you hug them, you buy them lunch, you do something, just let them know because I, I don't get to do what I do without them walking beside me. So real quick, Real Life Church, could you do me a favor and just show honor to all the volunteers and the staff and the people that serve here at Real Life Church? Yeah. They are so, so good. Proverbs chapter 18 is where we're going to be. Now, I got a question for you today. We are going to be moving out of the last four weeks. We've been talking about Solomon talking to his son and giving him wisdom lessons or lessons in wisdom. And now we're going to jump into Proverbs chapter 18. And over the next several weeks, we're going to be jumping into this breakdown of Proverbs. Some of them are very specific. Some of the chapters you're going to hear Solomon talk to his son about staying away from adulterous women. It's pretty good advice, right? That's, I mean, that's one you're going to want to hang on to. Uh, and so, like he said, there's a whole chapter on it, actually. But then there are other chapters where it's just like random, hey, I'm just going to shotgun you some wisdom statements, and I need you to pay attention. So some are specific, some have some variance in them. But chapter 18 gets into one that I think in the coming weeks, in our culture, in our country, could be really, really useful for us. How many of you have ever had an issue with your mouth? Oh, right <laughs> not many, not many of you. I'm surprised. <laughs> the rest of you have an issue with lying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I have... I am blessed to be a communicator. I get to be a preacher, a proclaimer of God's word. And with that gift, there is also a flip side or a dark side of that, that sometimes my my statements, my sarcasm, my frustrations can be very biting with my words. So sometimes I'm mean. Anybody else in here just mean sometimes? You don't mean to be, and like you, you really relate to the Snickers commercial, where like, I'm just hungry. I'm just a little hungry, a little grumpy, a little testy. Um, I, I think that, have you, any of you ever had a thought that you can think it, but you probably shouldn't say it? Like, that's an ugly baby. Like that one? Right? Like that's one you want to probably keep in here. You, know, you don't want to be the one that says that. You also got to, some, how many of you, your face talks just as loud as your voice does? <laughs> where you see the baby and you go, like that, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. You just said that baby's ugly without saying that baby's ugly. And so I, I'm finding that I, as I get older, these words or, or in, my, in my case, I have to be very careful with my words. I, and my pet peeves, I don't, I don't have a lot of pet peeves. How many of you have one or two pet peeves? Like, uh, like my wife, Jennifer, she, she has incredible hearing. And so like she can hear you chew. How many of you chewing is a pet peeve? Okay, all right. So like, I didn't know I did this, but I don't chew in rhythm. <laughs> Some of you are laughing because you're like, what does that even mean? Because you don't know. But most people, most people when you chew, you chew on time. Chew, 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 swallow. That's what you do. I do not. And I didn't know I didn't do this. And so I, I put a chip in my mouth, and I'm like, chew, chew. Chew, 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 chew. <laughs> chew, 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 chew. Waller, 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 swallow. Jennifer, one time, she said, what are you doing? I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, how do you, why do you chew like that? I'm like, with my mouth? She's like, no, why do you, why do you like, it's weird. Like, what do you, and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking. She's like, you don't chew. Like, most people just chew their food. And then I started listening to realize most people do. They just, they, you just, you don't even think about it. You're on time. It's not like clapping during worship, which some of you should not do. I'm being honest, Okay. <laughs> 
And so like, I, I didn't realize this, but I, I, so I, don't, I don't have a lot of pet peeves like that, but I have other things that are like, I have like uh, verbal pet peeves. So like when people use words that aren't words, I go, like I get a little cringe or like a little chill up my neck. Like when people use the word irregardless, I, don't be offended. It is a word. They have accepted it. The problem is it means the exact same thing as regardless. You just added letters. That's really all it is. You say that stuff bothers you. I mean, I don't lose sleep over it, but I'm kind of like, hmm. I remember I have, a, I, I have a lisp and I didn't know I had a lisp until somebody politely told me at dinner one time. And then I had to call my mom because I didn't know and no one told me. And I went to try out at a church and we went to dinner after church. And one of those sweet ladies from the church is like, so as a preacher and a communicator, how do you deal with having a lisp? And I'm like, I have a lisp. And she went, uh, yeah. And I looked at my wife, my partner, my best friend. And I kind of went, <laughs> I said, do I have a lisp? And she went, yeah. And then I'm in shock. So I like, I, I held it together and I got home and my mom and dad lived in Ohio and I called my mom, mom. She's like, yeah. And I'm like, do I have a lisp? She goes, well, it's not a bad one. <laughs> 25 years old, somebody should have let me know. <laughs> so like, I understand there are some things I do that are probably annoying to people. Like the front row, I'm sorry, I'm gonna spit on you, okay? I don't mean to, it just happens. Okay? But there are things like when someone says Pacific instead of specific, like I don't, like, if you have a Pacific purpose in your life, I don't mean to preach a nautical sermon to you, but I probably mean it's specific. So they're just things that, 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 that just, I hear him and I just, and so he's like, Vince, this, I don't know what this sermon is going to be about today. I promise it's a lot deeper than this. That stuff we all deal with. We all deal with annoying things regarding the words that people say. You ever have somebody go, oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. <laughs> that's rude, right? Or that's what I would say is rude until I'm sitting there and the TV on is in my, in my house and Jennifer says something to me and I'm going, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then one time she said, hey, and I'm like, yeah. She said, what did I just say? <laughs> um... Was it about the Chiefs winning by two touchdowns? Because if that's not what you said, I'm in a lot of trouble right now. Because <laughs> I, I shut off and I don't listen and it's really rude that I do that thing. And so like, I, I'm, I know I've got some stuff in my life. I've got some things and you go, yeah, but those are just small things. Those aren't really big things. Let me tell you something that as a believer, as a follower of Christ, God has given me this ability and given you this ability that that which is in your heart will come out of your mouth. And most of the time in a church setting, everybody's good with that. They're like, yep, out of the heart or out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Woo! And so we go, yes, what, what is that? Like, how does that, how are you gonna preach this? So let me break this down and say, as a believer, our words should be encouraging to the people around us and edifying and glorifying to the God in which we serve. Right? Everybody would agree with that. Unless I go in our current culture, in two weeks we're going to have an election and have the words that you've spoke about this election been glorifying to God. Have they edified and built up the people that you're speaking to? Or have you just tried to prove a point? hear that? It's 
been every service because I had to wrestle through it. Sometimes people go, man, Vince, you preach that sermon. I, I need you to understand something about preaching. My dad taught me this when I was very young. He said, the hardest thing about preaching is understanding that you have to get it first is that God's gonna rake you on some of the things, Vince, before you have the ability or the integrity to stand in front of a crowd and preach. Because if you don't work it out in your own heart, then you're gonna look like a hypocrite in front of other people. And so like, as I was reading through this and I'm digging into Proverbs and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, like this would be a good one, get to preach on. I was gonna title the sermon, Zip It. I didn't. <laughs> But I, I thought, man, this, I get to really soapbox on this a little bit. And God was like, hey, um, how are you doing in this? So it caused me to dig in. So I'm going to give you the key verse. And this is what it says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20 and 21. It says, from the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. All that to say, I know that's kind of some strange wording, but what he's saying is that you will be, when it talks about your stomach being satisfied, your soul is at peace. You, your person is at rest. You're satisfied. Things are good. And so prayerfully, out of the good things that you share in life, you're able to be at peace in your life. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. And this is what I want you to catch. Verse 21, death and life or in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You say, that's one verse, Pastor Vince, in chapter 18. Yeah, but Solomon was trying to make a point here as he began to write chapter 18. I'm going to give you some more of this chapter because there's some good ones in here. There's just some you're going to want to write down, all right? This is the first one, verse 2 in chapter 18. It says, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only expressing his own opinion. Y'all know anybody like that? Ain't no idea like their idea. I'm not going to listen. Any of you ever sat and listened to a conversation, not listening to a conversation, just waiting to respond? Yeah, me too. They get better. Verse 4, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters, but the fountain of wisdom is a babbling brook. And I, this one I had to dig into because I thought deep waters was a good thing. The problem with deep waters is you can't see the bottom. And so he said, a fool talks so much you never get to the bottom of it. But wisdom is a fountain that's a babbling brook. It's very, it's transparent. You can see it. It's, it's something you can receive. Deep waters, you don't know what's in the bottom. And so I was like, that's a pretty good one too. I like that one. The next one is my favorite. This is my favorite, verse six and seven. A fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. Come on, somebody. It's good stuff right there, right? A fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. A fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are a snare. They're a trap to his soul. Verse 13 says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is foolishness and shame. So Solomon's trying to make a point here, right? I mean, it's pretty clear he's going, hey, you're supposed to talk, but make sure when you talk, it gives life. It gives life. People are better, stronger when they leave you than when they got to you. Are your words doing that in people? And so today I'm gonna to give you just a couple things. I just wanna give you two things really to lean into in this in regards to your words because again, I don't get to follow you around. I'm not gonna follow you around this week. I'm not gonna make sure I'm not gonna record any of your conversations. I don't do that. This is between you and the Lord. But I just wanna kind of plant a seed here of you. Are you buying into, are you submitting to God and saying, Lord, Help the words that I speak bring life to people. Are the words that I'm saying, are they bringing life and building up or are they bringing death and I'm tearing down? This is not easy because we live in a broken world with broken people. And it's really easy for us to look around and see the negative and dive into the negative and just live in that. Just, it's easier, right? How many of you know the negative words stick a lot more? There's something sticky in the slime of a negative statement. 
it's easier. We'll, we'll spend an hour talking trash, but we stumble over giving a compliment. And it ought, to, it ought not be that way for us as believers. It ought not be that way for us as followers of Christ. Say, Pastor Vince, I'm human. I'm going to mess up. I understand you're going to mess up. I understand there's going to be moments where your brain doesn't catch what comes out of your mouth. Right? But do you have an intentional attempt at filtering the things that come out so that God gets the glory? Is there an intentional attempt to do that? So here's the two things I want you to do. First thing is this. I want you to speak life-giving words to others every chance you get. Life-giving words to others every chance you get. This is where we hold back on the ugly baby. Okay? This is where you hold back on. You wearing that? Any of y'all ever walk into that? Wives? You ever have to do that to your husband? Like, whew, not a good idea. It's not a good idea. Who fixed your hair? That's not a good one either. Okay? Some things you're going to want to watch. This is what this says. See, we get into this and we can kind of laugh about that stuff, but you know that the, the comparison conversations that come out of our mouth, the statements that land and land deep in the souls of people are statements like, I thought you could do better. I, th- I, I, don't know, I don't know if you'll ever amount to. You're never any good. I can't believe you're not more like. And we throw these things out not thinking about them and those bury deep into the heart of individuals and they bring death. I can tell you this. I, I've mentioned this a time or two, but I can still tell you the look on my fourth grade teacher's face when she said, Vince, are you stupid? I can tell you the look on her face. I would say probably subconsciously it's still the reason I read four to six books a month. It's because I don't ever want anybody to think that about me. I also can now look back as an adult and go, that teacher barely spoke English She may not have even had the right words to say. I don't think her intention was to call me ignorant in front of the world. I just don't think she knew any better. So I may have been able to process through that. But the negative weight of that sat in me for a long time. I wonder wonder how much more life-giving things we have to say to change the life of somebody. I wonder if we even think about, like, man, I, because I, here's the thing. If I want to speak life-giving words to you or to anybody else, I got to spend a little bit of time getting to know you, or I'm not going to know what gives you life. I'm not going to know what actually encourages you, what lifts you up, what builds you up. If I just walk by and go, hey, you're awesome, and never add anything to that, about the third or fourth time, you're going to be like, he, he has no idea. He's just chattering. So I got to take the time to know that it's a life-giving statement. When you give, when you, when you have this, this idea of I want to give life to you, then I also have to make the decision that I'm going to do life with you so that I can speak life in you. I'm going to have to be around. I'm going to have to find some moments to know how to encourage. Hey, how you doing? You doing okay? Man, I'm hearing great things. I'm hearing stuff from people about you that says you're doing your job right, that says you're doing it well, and I'm proud of you, and I'm proud you're doing it the way you're doing it. Like those kind of moments lift people up. But we're not intentional about doing them. We might do them occasionally. If we get an opportunity, we might. But do you set aside, and this is not me either, in the morning, in the night before, God, give me an opportunity tomorrow to build somebody, to lift them up. This is what the Bible says in Ephesians. It says, let no corrupt talk. These are not easy verses. I'm just going to tell you right now. Let no corrupting talk come from your mouth, but only such as good, for building up as fits the occasion. Why? That it might give grace to those that hear you talk. That it might be a gift. When you leave people, are they like, man, it was a gift to talk to them. When your kids leave you, do your kids feel like it was a gift to talk to you? 
when your spouse, well, they're, they're the ones that know me best, doesn't mean you get to be a jerk just because they know you best. It's not how that works. Is it a gift? That word grace in the New Testament means both grace and gift. That's what he says there. Hey, don't let any corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is a gift that is seen as a gift to the people that you're speaking to. Oh, Vince, you want me to walk around like there's rainbows shooting out my mouth all the time, like I'm just this happy person. No, listen, you ain't gotta be fake. You just have to be intentionally real. You have to set it in your heart to say the right things. And it is not easy. And so when I ask you to do this, this is what I want you just thinking. The other people, I'm gonna do my best this week. God, give me three people this week that I can build up. I'm gonna call them and I'm just gonna lift them up. I'm just gonna call them. Hey, how you doing? I'm praying for you. I pray God wins in your life today. What are you wrestling through? I think you're gonna be fine in this. And I want you to encourage them. Okay? Over the next several weeks, you're gonna have the opportunity to dive into as much venom and verbal vomit as you would like. How many of you know that's true? Just jump on social media for about five minutes and you will see it. And I'm gonna ask you to abstain. I'm gonna ask you to remember the fact that Jesus Christ is still on the throne no matter what happens in two weeks. No matter what happens in two weeks. And I know everybody's got an opinion on it. But at the end of two weeks, Jesus is still the king. And that's what still matters. And I'm going to speak life because as a follower of Christ, as a sojourner here, if you don't know what that means, it just means I'm a traveler here. This world is not my home. The old song said, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. One day I'm going to go there. While I'm here, I'm going to act like a representative of that nation and do my best to change this one on its behalf. And so I'm going to speak life-giving words. When you think something good, say it. Good. When you think it's good, say it. Yeah, but that's weird, Pastor. It's not weird. We just don't do it. The reason we think it's weird is because it's uncommon. Right? People thought indoor toilets were weird when they first came out. They're like, you going to do that in your house? And now you're like, you could do that someplace other than your house? Yeah, you could have done it in the backyard by the patio. See how weird that is now? Yeah. I know some of you are like, this sermon just took a turn. I get it. Second thing, I want you to not only speak life-giving words to others every chance you get, but I want you to speak life-giving words to yourself and to your circumstance. Now, I want you to hear me on this because we have to be really careful. Because we live in a spiritual culture. I want to be careful. Like, all right, when, I want you to lean in. You're going to hear a lot of spiritual people say things like, I'm just going to declare this in my life. I'm going to speak this out. And I want to clarify something real quickly in you. You don't have the authority. It's only Jesus. The only thing you get to declare in your life is Jesus. Anything else is up to him. Because if it worked the other way, then you would be in his seat and you ain't him. I'm not him. And so we have to be real careful. You'll hear, you'll get, you can jump on the TV, you can jump on radio or the internet, and you can find somebody out there going, if you'll just claim this in your life, then it'll be so. No, that is a false teaching. You say, how can you say that? How many of you right now have prayed that God would heal somebody and he didn't? Let me clarify this. He didn't heal them the way you wanted him to. You see, and if we start buying into this lie that the devil tells us that you and I have this authority to push and pull Christ and the power of heaven and earth simply because we claim it in our life, it creates a much harder separation when God doesn't answer on your standard. Because how many times have, people, have you heard people go, I just don't know why God didn't answer my prayer. 
I don't know where God was in this situation. I don't know. You have to be careful. He says, so what do I do, Pastor Vince? Doesn't the Bible say that if you have enough faith, you can say to the mountain, be thou removed, and it'll be tossed into the sea? That's what I'm talking about. Read your Bible. When you read your Bible, what you find out is that's Jesus saying that, and he's talking to a crowd of people, and he's going, listen, if you have faith in me, if you'll bring the mountain to me, I created it. I can move it. I can move it. And we so often don't want to do that. We want to jump. And we will spend most of the time in our life talking about our mountain rather than talking to the creator of the mountain on how to move it. You'll talk about the issues in your life. You'll talk about the broken relationships. You'll talk about the broken the marriages and the broken friendships and the broken this and the broken that. You'll talk about it till it's nearly just beat to death. Well, if I could just find a man, if I could just find a woman, if, I, if my kids would act right, if my boss was not a jerk, if my this, my, if my church would do better, if my, and we'll just talk about it. We feel that's somehow going to change the situation. It doesn't. You say, okay, so then how do I speak positive? How do I speak life into myself and into my circumstance? You trust the promises of God. You learn them. You download them into your life. You download them because the world is going to tell you you're not enough. But the promise of God says that I have known you and I formed you and I gave you a purpose and a plan in this life. That's not you claiming some sort of inward ability. That's you claiming the promise of God in your life that you have. How can you say that? Because God says it about me. That's how I can say it. My creator called me by name. My creator is the one who gives me this promise. Here's some of the promises that he gives. This is what God says about you in scripture, that you were equipped and you were gifted by God, that you are God's workmanship. When the world says you're not worth anything, when your spouse tells you that you're broken, when an ex tells you that you're worthless, when your kids say that they hate you and you don't know what to do, you go, wait, 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 wait. Lord is my refuge and my rock and my strength. The Lord says I am his workmanship created in Christ. The Lord says that I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. The Lord says he has a plan and a purpose for me, and it is good regardless of what the world tries to tell me, regardless of what my circumstances try to tell me. God's plan is good. How do you know? Because the book says it's good. That's how I know. I don't have to try to trust myself, guys. I had a mullet. I can't trust me. Now, I wouldn't do one now. It looks funny with the bald head. I can't trust me. I have lived in the same house for six years, and I still ask my wife where stuff is. I can't trust me. I'm supposed to just name it and claim it? No. No. He named me redeemed, and so I will claim him as father and creator. That's what I'll do, because it doesn't matter. He will provide everything that I need according to his riches and glory. That I can cast my cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for me. And when I want to speak into the situations in my life that are broken, Lord, I need your help in this scenario, in this situation. And your word says that you have never left me nor forsaken me, so I'm going to trust you in the process. I'm going to trust you regardless of the outcome. But Pastor Vince, can't we as believers just, no, he's not a genie. In fact, according to scripture, you should probably, this is not the most encouraging thing in the world. You should probably prepare for trouble. Matthew, in this life, there will be trouble. Don't worry about tomorrow. Why not? Because there's going to be enough stuff in tomorrow to worry about tomorrow. You're like, wait, they don't put that on a coffee cup. No. (laughs) You don't want to flip over to that calendar date. Like, what does March say? March is going to (laughs) suck. Matthew chapter six and seven. It's not, you're like, wait a minute. I need, I'm going to need some, I need something that makes me feel better. 
God's not concerned with making you feel better. God's concern is to make you holy. And holiness draws us out of things. It's not easy. Now, the good news is, even with the trials, even with the trouble, he is there. He is there. And there is peace in the midst of a storm like Peter walking on the water. There is peace in the midst of a trial like Daniel sitting in a lion's den. There is peace. Why? Not because of what I'm capable of doing, but, but because of what my God is capable of doing and desires to do in my life. I want to speak the name of Jesus over everything in my life. Not as some fantastical wish, but as the truth of his word. The authority of the Holy Spirit in my life lived out through the word of God. That's what I have. You say, Vince, is it that important? I mean, God knows my heart. Let's check. Matthew chapter 12. This again, these words are in red. And every time I read this verse, I have a little bit of a knot in my stomach. It says this, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure brings forth evil. And this is Jesus, he gets real serious. He says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word that they speak. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you'll be condemned. Every time I think about that, I'm like, that is why time as we know it ceases to exist because I'm gonna be there for a minute giving account for every careless word I've ever spoke. Every word out of anger, every word out of bitterness, every word out of jealousy, every word out of maliciousness, every word out of unforgiveness, every useless and careless word that I spoke out of emotion, I am going to stand before God the Father and give account for it. What are you doing with it? How do you shift it? How do you change it in your life? You be intentional. You make a plan. Today, I'm gonna speak life. Today, I'm gonna speak life. I'm not gonna criticize. I'm not gonna jump on the bandwagon and complain. I'm gonna speak life. Vince, people, people are hard. Yeah, they are. But most of them, it's been so long since anybody spoke life into them. What have they got to work with? Think about it in your life. When's the last time somebody outside of maybe your common circle spoke life to you, spoke something positive to you, spoke an encouragement to you, gave you an attaboy or an girl? When's the last time outside the church wall that happened? That's who we're supposed to be. That's when God will get the glory. And when God gets the glory, his church always wins. His church always wins. Bow with me. Father in heaven, we love you. Jesus, I thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your love. I, got, I thank you that, I thank you that even in the moments I need to come and repent of my words, of speaking out of frustration, of speaking out of anger. Honestly, God, of just speaking and not thinking first. Forgive me. Give me the words to say. But Lord, give me the ears to hear you and the heart to follow you. And then, Lord, I will trust that out of that heart that's following you, my mouth will speak words that are giving life. 
And we ask all this in Jesus' name. All God's people say, amen. Amen.